All right, this morning I have a balloon with me. A balloon is a simple toy, wouldn't you say? But it brings lots of pleasure to people of all ages, correct? There are so many things that you can do with a balloon. What do you like to do with one? All right, you can use balloons for decorations at birthday parties. Has your mom ever blew them up and hung them up for decorations? No. Gotta get with the times, Mom. Gosh. I've done it for other events, just not for a birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> or you can blow it up and bat it around the house. The bad thing is I got a head shake from a kid, then I got a head shake from one an uh, adult up front. <laughs> now if you had long skinny balloons, you might could even make balloon animals out of them. Yes, a balloon can bring lots of happiness, but it also can bring sadness and disappointment too. If a child's balloon pops, the child may cry. You probably would too, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, you and I are sometimes like a balloon. We sometimes get all puffed up and think we're better than other people. Sometimes we may think we're better than other people and we expect everyone else to think so too. Maybe we think we're smarter than other kids in our class. Or maybe we think no one is as good as we are in sports. Or perhaps we think we are a better singer than anyone else. Sooner or later, if we keep getting puffed up and thinking we're better than others, something will happen to burst our balloon. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. The Bible teaches us not to be proud and think we're better than other people. Jesus says we are to be humble and re realize that when we are good at something, it is because God strengths God strengths in us. From now on, when you see a balloon, I hope it will remind you that we should not become too puffed up and think we're better than other people. Would you like to pray? Jesus, help us to be humble and not think we are better than other people. Remind us that whatever abilities we have are a gift from you and that you are the one who deserves the praise. You are the great one. Amen. Good morning, church. Our nation was doubly shocked this year by the tragic deaths of two profound and legendary musicians, Tina Turner and Jimmy Buffett. When we mourn the loss of someone who has achieved greatness in their own rights, and consider their achievements. We often follow a draw to look inwards and evaluate our life's significance. It's as if the grief and shock, anger, possible denial, and at times the deep sense of loss has given us a past to still our lives and inquire of the stir within us that beckons us to consider the significance of our own experience on this side of heaven. Within this wrestling of life's significance, we ask ourselves questions such as, what is most important in life? 
How do I live fully so that I am ready to die? Will I leave a legacy that benefits those who I leave behind? How will what I build in this life carry into my eternal life? As humans, we desire a life of worth, of significance. It is part of our DNA. Although significance is in the eye of the beholder, if we believe our life carries a weight of goodness, that benefits the world and those we love now and in the hereafter. We will desire to leave this world knowing it served a purpose. So what makes our lives significant? We know that work, play, things, our tribe of people, our house, investments, and even our service can add value to our lives. But they don't, they do not define it. Therefore, I want my life to be significant. What underlying values or practices should I be participating in so that it is significant now and hereafter. The Bible says that the practice of gratitude gives us a life here and after significance. Through gratitude, we appreciate life's goodness, which compels us to pay it forward. Gratitude creates within us a deep sense of happiness and satisfaction, which in turn enriches our relationships, nurtures our formation of new friendships, and underlies the very foundation of human society. So, what is gratitude? Gratitude is a practice of actively remembering and expressing the grace the benefits we do not deserve and goodness bestowed in our lives. We have an innate desire to show gratitude for the goodness and grace we receive. Early in the Bible, we witness one of the most, one of the first acts of gratitude through the life of Noah. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground. So they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in numbers on it. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his son's wife. All the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground, all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ark, one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taken some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. After being on the ark, for approximately a full year, Noah walks off the boat, and then Noah builds an altar for the Lord. Noah's first recorded act upon leaving the ark was an act of gratitude. When listening to or reading this story, this act of worship is easily to read over. Without close, closer reading, it appears to be a simple practice. But when we do a little more digging, we see it as extraordinary ordinary act of thankfulness. First, consider the fact that Noah spent approximately 356 days on the ark. As he walked off the plank, Noah makes a conscious decision that the very first thing he will do 
is to say thank you to God. God did not direct him to do so. At this time, in the ancient Near Eastern civilization, God had not given commandments or statutes regarding worship. Organized religion and faith practices were still a thousand years away from being formed. Noah and his family have been the only followers of God amongst a society of evil heathens. Therefore, this was a singular practice to God, not a communal practice of his people. Offering a sacrifice of thanksgiving was not a social, religious, economic habit of his days. In ancient Near Eastern pagan worship, when a sacrifice was made, it was offered to appease the God and keep them happy so that the people would receive good fortune. Noah did not offer a sacrifice out of the need to have good fortune, a desire to keep God happy or praise Him. He offered His sacrifice out of a heart of gratitude. His natural inclination upon leaving this ginormous wooden box was to say thank you. Now let's consider the many things Noah could have done upon leaving the ark by taking a moment to imagine ourselves in this same scenario. For a solid year, you have been stowed up inside a dark ship. A ship drenched in the stench and mess of every animal on earth. During this time, you have been tossed around by the Near Eastern world, by the deafening winds, rain, and waves. When the, the ark finally banks itself on the mountaintop and you can walk out into the fresh air, what do you imagine your first act in this new world would be? Would it be to build an altar and say thank you? God, knowing Noah's heart, God understood that Noah leaving the ship and offering that sacrifice was more than sacrifice. The Lord smelt the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in numbers and fill the earth. As the aroma of Noah's sacrifice drifted up to the Lord, his heart is touched. And in turn, he says, I will never again curse the ground because of man's evil heart or kill every creature. And God blessed Noah. Blessing Noah was not a response to anything Noah had earned. His blessing was not because he was a stellar ship captain who kept the morale of his crew in high spirits, nor for having completed the ark building by God's building codes. Nor was it a reward for his exceptional care of God's last remaining creatures on earth. Noah's blessing was not a response to his obedience, although blessings do come from choosing obedience. In this story, we learn Noah received his blessing because he chose to worship, which pleased the Lord, because his heart was thankful. And Noah's emotions overflowed into an act of gratitude and offering. In the English word, word, uh, 
The English word gratitude stems from the Latin word gratia, which means to give thanks. The Bible takes this one word definition further. In the Bible, gratitude is the word Eucharistia, which stems from the word charis, which means grace. Charis, grace. A favor, an act of goodwill and love and kindness for which we do not deserve. Eucharistia is an offering of thanks out of the abundance of grace shown to us. It is to give thanks to the Lord with pleasure and delight because we have received delight and pleasure from His grace. Charis. Charistia is not a horizontal practice. It is not a give and take to and from. Grace does not travel one way and then come back again. Eucharistia is receptacle. It is a cycle of giving and receiving all at the same time. It is grace abounding. The Bible tells us that God does not desire sacrifices for sacrificial sake, but that He delights in our expression, our declare praise and adoration, which is an outward expression of what is in our hearts. By choosing to practice gratitude, we choose the grace that God had freely offered us and offered it freely back to Him and others. It is important to know that the gratitude we are talking about is much more than a simple thank you comment. Practicing Eucharistia flows out of the sentiments of thankfulness. The gratitude for God's grace is more than a mere recognition of God's grace but a felt response which demands that we express this response. I recently read an article about a police officer responding to a man threatening suicide by jumping off the top of a high building. When the officer arrived at the scene, the man was on the ledge uttering as he positioned himself, perched to jump. No one loves me. No one cares if I die. No one will miss me. The officer said it was as if the man, this man's despair was painfully evident and he repeated the sentiment over and over. As other officers tried to talk him off the ledge, the officer realized the situation was getting worse, not better, and that the man on the ledge was going to jump. As the officer witnessed this man's pain, he said all he could think at that moment was, I love this man. I care for this man. So this officer, so this is what the officer offered this man on the ledge. This inherent feeling of love that he had for him. As the man continued vocalizing his brokenness, the officer gently stated, Don't jump. I love you. You are loved. You are not alone. And someone cares for you. I care for you. I love you. The officer said this repeatedly. The surrounding officers testified that these words brought the man out of his trance of despair. As the officer continued to tell the stranger on the ledge that he loved him, the man climbed off the ledge and fell into the officer's arms. Sobbing, the officer held him, embraced him, and continued to repeat that he loved him. When the reporter asked the officer why he felt that this way about a man he did not even know, 
The officer replied something to the effect of, I just felt I love him even though I did not even know him. And it broke my heart to see him feel so unloved because I am loved. I knew I loved him. This is God's grace poured out in an expression of love. When we receive God's grace in our life, we naturally want to express it. We do not always know how it will come out or be used or where it will go. But when this grace is received, it desires to be expressed. It is easy to recognize God's grace in our lives when life's greater needs are met or when we are the recipient of unmerited generosity. Children are the perfect example of this. As parents, one of the biggest tasks of raising a polite and emotionally aware children who says what? Thank you. At our child's birthday party, we continuously remind our children, say thank you. At the grocery store, when a store employee gives our child a free sample without even thinking about it, and before it's hardly in our child's hand, we blurt out our go-to response. What do we say? Implying there is to be a response, response of gratitude for this free and undeserved gift. As parents, I would even venture to say that some of our most humiliating parenting moments arise from our child's ungrateful behaviors when words and actions are perceived as disrespect. For I've also heard many parents say this same thing. Be respectful. Say thank you. However, when it comes to some of the smaller graces in life, or better put, more subtle graces in life, because we do not necessarily feel them at that moment, we often fail to recognize God's abundant grace through our day. The litmus test is actively identifying God's grace in our lives is in and of itself our practice of gratitude. When, when does God hear me offer caress for his caress in my life? Is it only <coughs> at dinner when I am in a way to fill my belly? How does my response to his grace sound? Do I contemplate his grace and say thank you out of this intentional reflection of the goodness and kindness he has given me? Or do I just repeat the same four lines I always say before bed? Do I take the time to consider moments of God's goodness and kindness throughout my day? When I get up in the morning, do I say as David, thank you God for another morning with new mercies? When Pappy would have a moment of clarity and recall a warm memory, did I thank God for gracing us with the shared moment of remembrance. When I get to watch my grandkids practice martial arts and get a belt promotion, do I rec recognize that it is only by the grace of God that I am still here to see it? Am I thankful that I have the mental and physical capacity for me to be still able to experience this? When we slow down and take the time to recognize caress in our lives, as believers, we will desire 
Eucharistia. If God's grace is all around us, in us, and working through us, then we inherently desire the willingness to show and receive gratitude at recognizing God's grace and are expected to do so. There is a ritual tucked into the middle of Passover that is often a notice in the story. And unless you are familiar with the Jewish traditions, you probably have heard little or nothing about it. Before Passover night, the Lord gave clear and precise instructions to the Israelite people regarding the actual Passover event. How the Israelites were to leave Egypt and the rituals and practices of the Passover traditions for generations to come. After directing the Israelites in the event of Passover night, Moses then informed the Israelites that they will be practicing a feast, a Passover feast. And the rituals for all the generations to come, speaking on behalf of God, Moses says, obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, why does this ceremony, what does the ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bow down and worship. Now you may be wondering what this passage has to do with gratitude or grace. God knows that humans can be forgetful. He also knows that nations commonly repeat the same mistakes throughout history for one primary reason. They forget the lessons from the past. God knew that he did not set future practices in place to help the Israelites remember their salvation from Egypt. They would eventually forget his extravagant act of grace. And this significant event would be lost on his people. Their lack of remembrance would lead to a lack of gratitude. And without gratitude towards the Lord for what he has done, their hearts would grow hard. They would forget the Lord's salvation and they would once again end up as slaves. So when the children would ask, why do we practice the Passover? God wanted the adults to respond by remembering the Passover with, with gratitude for their salvation. Although the word gratitude is not mentioned, it is implied as part of their salvation ongoing work. If they wanted to live as a nation of significance and not fall back into a nation of slaves once again, they had to practice remembering God's grace in their lives. The Passover was more than just a ritual. It was a practice of gratitude. Practicing gratitude, receiving and expressing God's grace is the foundation for building a life of significance. Gratitude is a fluid virtue and other virtues such as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, thanks, thankfulness, and self-control piggybacks upon intentionally giving and receiving God's grace. The practice of gratitude. Most, if not all, virtues are built upon living out of a state of gratitude. Cicero said gratitude was the mother of all the remaining virtues. Seneca believed a spirit of 
ungratefulness right below thieves, rapists, and adulterers. In a scientific journal, compromised of hundreds of studies on gratitude compiled by Berkeley, researchers find that the desire to express and receive gratitude stems from our biological roots, roots that appear to be embedded in our history. The structure of our brain in, the, in our child development. Although gratitude can be heavily influenced by culture, it also appears to be an inherent part of human nature, even in animals. Animals such as chimpanzees, fish, and birds all exhibit a desire to receive and express gratitude called receptacle altruism. Through receptacle altruism, they initiate a behavior that helps another. And unrelated individuals, even at the cost of themselves, because they initiate, they initially know that receptacle altruism, gratitude, will benefit them later. Our desires to express, receive, and give grace is what makes life significant. When we ask ourselves what is most important, we must access within the realm of grace for the for if practicing gratitude is the virtue that surpasses all other virtues, then anything of importance would have to be built upon living out of God's grace and expressing God's grace and gratitude. As the officer taught the gentleman off the ledge, something deeply ingrained in his human nature inspired him to share what he felt in his own life with the man. These questions, what is most important in life? How do I live fully so that I am ready to die? Will I leave a legacy that benefits those who I leave behind? How will what I built in this life carry into my eternal life? The answer to these questions is not a response to our doing. Noah understood obedience leads us to receive grace, but it does not create grace. Grace is a gift that piggybacks upon nothing. To live a meaningful life, we must begin by accepting what is freely given and offering this grace back to God and others by practicing gratitude. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.